Welcome to another episode of The Theatre Podcast, intimate personal conversations with theatre's biggest names. I am your host, Alan Seals. And I am your producer, Jillian Hoffman. And we launched a Patreon. Yes, we did. Please visit us at thetheaterpodcast.com slash Patreon to show your support in any way that you feel is appropriate. Our basic level is just for support. We have super, super duper levels that can get you merch, that can get you included in these reflection sections that get your name in show notes. There's so many different options. And when we get to a certain number of patrons, then we're going to do a couple of nice things. Like one of my favorite things that I want to do is really start paying for a service to give us transcriptions so that we can make the, the episodes more accessible to those who may want to read it instead of listen to it. But um, anyway, without further ado, this episode is with Christopher Sieber, who is now starring in The Prom on Broadway, which was just nominated for seven Tony Awards, including Best New Musical. And Jillian, have you noticed that his character, Trent Oliver, continues a trend of characters that he continues to play who are really full of themselves. Yeah, Chris Christopher has a a habit of always picking up really great juicy characters who are just narcissistic, selfish, crazy men. Um, but, but he's nothing but he's like not. that. He's so nice. He's nothing like that. And That's acting. There was one thing that I wish I had asked him in the interview that, like, in retrospect, I, I wish I had that I didn't, was... If he actually has a problem playing, or not a problem, but if it's more difficult for him to play the real life character, or play the not exaggerated character, mm-hmm. but he just plays narcissistic so well. <laughs> Can you play non narcissistic people, Chris? Let us know. But he also has a reputation. There's been several times when he's gone into full productions with like four days' notice. Yeah, he is someone who has just jumped in and said yes, and he trusts his own abilities and knows what he can do. And he's like, yeah, let's do it. Why not? So he he talks about a couple different shows where he had sometimes less than a week to learn a whole production and, and make it happen. Mm-hmm. And that is some true artistry right there. Yeah, with Spamalot, it was funny because he came in and the sides he was given, he already had memorized because mm-hmm. he was a kid. He was a fan of Monty Python. Python. Python fan. But uh, yeah, anyway, everyone, please enjoy this episode with Christopher Sieber. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with two-time Tony-nominated actor, nominated for his performances in Spamalot as Galahad and in Shrek as the wonderful Lord Farquaad. He's also been seen in Matilda, Pippin, Chicago, Lacage, Thoroughly Modern Millie, and Hair, with a career spanning 25 years on Broadway and a successful TV career, which includes one of my personal favorites, Pushing Daisies, Aww. in addition to the role of Kevin Burke in Two of a Kind, starring <laughs> Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen. He's now starring as Trent Oliver in The Prom, which has been nominated for seven 2019 Tony Awards, including Best New Musical. Chris Sieber, welcome to the Hel- podcast. Hello. Hello. Hi. Gosh, when you say all that stuff, it's amazing. 25 you, years? I know. I've I just kind of, I've been very lucky. I just went from one thing to the next. So I, 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 I could, but when you say it out loud, it's crazy. I cut some stuff too. I know. You <laughs> forgot Into the Woods. Oh, yes. Yeah, in, Into, Into the, the Woods. Woods. Yeah, with Vanessa Williams. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, a little show called Paper Moon that where Brooks Ash Manskis and I actually met. We actually did sign a Broadway contract. So we actually consider it. A Broadway credit because we did get paid two weeks' salary when the producer said we're not coming into New York. <laughs> so oh. I met that was 26 years ago where I met Brooks Eschmanskis. Isn't that crazy? Wow. But th- yeah, I mean, and now yeah. uh, we think just thinking about all that stuff they just said, it's insane. Because um, like I said, 26 years ago, that's kind of when I started, and and now we have kids in our show, the prom that weren't even born yet. You have 13 kids. Yeah, making their and they're all debut. under 26 or less. So yeah. it's, uh, the liver spots are bursting on my skin. Let me just tell you that. You don't look a day I over. don't, you know what it is? Yeah, Suns- you- sunscreen, moisturizer, every day. Every really? single day. Yep. Jillian's Wait, point. Yeah, Jillian, our engineer here is shaking her head, yes. Yeah. I, I just don't wash my face. Oh, you got to wash your face. That's not true. I do wash, wash face. my face. Wash your face, face. Sunscreen and moisturizer. I just do, do a 30 SPF every single day. Yeah. That's, I actually, I will do that because yeah, you, it's really your easy. skin looks really good. It's really good, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Except for the inherited um, dark circles and eye bags under my eyes. Yeah, I got those. Thanks, too. Grandma. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Grandma. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, for that. Yeah. Yep. thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Jane Sieber. Well, 
Tell me about <laughs> tell me about <laughs> grandma. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jay, let's talk about. We Jane. just I go off on tangents. Just so you know, I will go off somewhere left field, and then we'll finally get back to your question eventually. Anyway. Well, I will undoubtedly come up with five more questions okay. on your cool. journey. So, all right, we're in good. You're in good company. But tell me about Jane Sieber. Tell me about where you grew up. Uh, Jane, Jane Jane Sieber, my grandmother. Okay, well, I grew up in a very small town called Wyoming, Minnesota. Wait, and Wyoming, Minnesota. Wyoming, Minnesota. It was kind of like a really boring, sleepy little farm town, and um, they really couldn't come up with an original name, so they named it after a state. So it's <laughs> Wyoming, Minnesota, <laughs> the two most boring states. Actually, Minnesota is awesome. I love Minnesota. I, I mean, it, it, it gave me, uh, uh, I, I think it built me who I am now. My resilience and my my, uh, my sense of humor came from that. Um, but we grew up, yeah, like a small town. It was a, it was a, a town. It's uh, mostly soybeans, cornfields, and pigs is where I grew up. But well, we didn't grow up on a farm. I, uh, but we grew up downtown Wyoming, which mm-hmm. is, you know, it didn't, when I grew up there, when I, when I moved there, it had a population of 642 and they had a four way stop. That was it. We had a bar, we had a hardware store, oh, a tiny, gro- tiny, a grocery store and a gas station. And that is all we had. That's all we had. Wow. And a four way stop. Uh, oh, we had a bank too. Yeah. The first, what is it? Wyoming's first state bank. Did you have a blockbuster? No, no, <laughs> we didn't have anything. I mean, the nearest town was about five miles away and that was even a, it was a sm- larger, smaller town. Yeah. But yeah, we were about 30 miles north of the Twin Cities. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. And you're the middle of three? I'm middle, middle of three. Yeah. Three boys. Yes. Mike is the eldest. I'm the middle. And Mark, my younger brother, is uh, the, the youngest. And uh they're both married with uh, kids, and now my now my older brother has, has both his kids have left the house. They're empty nesters already. Wow! Oh my god! And um, uh, they my brother's a computer engineer, and he does all sorts of stuff with computers, and he builds firewalls for like McAfee and Norton virus, and so it's really cool. He's got this huge computer screen craziness in his uh, one of his in his uh, rooms in his house, and he works from home, and he builds fire. He's it's very kind of like FBI kind of. Cool stuff. That's crazy he's cool. Got, that. um, like, uh, you know that, that nine screen layout that you see on the movies? He's yeah. got that. Yeah. He does that. And it's really cool. One of the screen always has the matrix yeah, code Yeah, it does. It. Yeah. It's cool. I, 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 he says, you want to see my office? I said, sure. So I went in there and I saw this whole huge thing. I was like, how do you see? What, what are you doing? I have no idea. I mean, he doesn't know what I do. I mean, he gets an idea. He says our finished product, which is, you know, the show. But, you know, I don't have no idea what, how we, what he does. Anytime I have a computer problem, I said, Mike, can you fix my computer? And he's, yeah, yeah, I bring it over here. So the answer is less porn. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty much yeah, the answer every you, time. Yeah. You got to, that, that fills up the hard drive. <laughs> oh, hey, yo. Yeah. Um, when did performing come in then? And I guess, like, obviously, your brother, uh, did you perform together? And he no, just was like, oh, no, I was, I was always the weird kid in school. I was a young, fat, toad like boy with thick glasses. I mean, I have thick glasses now, but they're thinner lenses, but, um, uh, I have a very bad vision and, um, uh, I, my parents had this fantastic picture window in the front of the house that was almost floor to ceiling. And they had the curtains that went from floor to ceiling and they would open like a proscenium, like a theater. And, um, I always pictured like the front yard as an audience and I would put on shows in the living room. And, um, my younger brother, Mark would act as stage manager and we, he would drop a needle on a record and I'd lip sync to like, uh, you know, Fiddler on the Roof and Dinah Washington and, um, what, uh, Barry Manilow was, was quite the hit for the, uh, the grass, the grass loved it and unsuspecting neighbors driving by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I put on shows and the shows were about five minutes long and I, I put on shows and I usually just for myself you know, but imagining, you know, one day that I'd be on a stage and looking out and seeing an audience or not seeing an audience because they're in the dark. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I would put on shows and one was called the, the what was it? The Christopher Sieber Comedy Cavalcade of 1976. <laughs> and I, I thought it was funny, um, but I didn't have quite an audience, you know. And besides the blades of grass, yeah, the blades of grass and, you know, the dogs and the people walking by or riding their bikes by. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I I put on shows, but yeah, we, I would lip sync to records mostly. When, when was this? How old were you? I was probably seven, seven. I started. So when did you know? But you know, you grew up in this small town. There is nothing to do. And there was no internet. Internet. There was none. I mean, we had, what is, I don't even know what you call it. Terrestrial TV, you know, the antenna TV. Yeah. That's what we had. And we had five channels. That's it. 
And I had the records. I had my, my parents had the vinyl records. So I would listen to records all the time with the headphones on and just scream at the top of my lungs and drive them crazy. Um, but it would, uh, it was, um, there was just nothing to do. So I had to entertain myself. And then I, at school in elementary, it was a very, very small elementary school too. I think there was maybe 60 kids uh, from first to sixth grade, about 60 kids. Total. Was it all in the same building? It was like in one the of same schools, building yeah. and it was, there were only six classrooms. Wow. And first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And that was it. So and you knew everybody. I, you for, really do. Yeah. You knew everybody. You knew everybody's dog. You knew everybody's car. Um, and the gossip that went around was really juicy. Oh yeah. And I'm sure the dating life was either really good or really bad. Re it's, I, I would not know anything about that, but, um, <laughs> you know, so there was nothing to do. So I put on shows and, and, uh, try to entertain myself and I try to entertain others, but a lot of people just kind of like turn the other way. <laughs> it was like, Oh, that's Christopher. He's just doing weird stuff again. Well, where did, where did, I mean, at what age you said he was seven, you were putting on the shows, but at what age did you, did you then realize like, Oh, I think I kind of want to make a career out of this or did that ever um, come? It was later? around third grade. Um, like in the, in this, so in the small Wyoming elementary school, um, I think her name was Miss Bobson, my third grade teacher. They decided that, um, I was, uh, I was special and I had some sort of talent or something. And so they decided, or the gifted children. And so they decided that they, I should probably be, be, um, shipped off to Minneapolis once or twice a week to go to the children's theater in Minneapolis, where you could be part of something and kind of be in a show or just be, kind of be around in it or whatever. And, um, that was the first taste of actual experience in front of a huge audience where I was, I think I played a cookie. I, I think the play, the play was called the cookie jar <laughs> and it was the children's theater. So of course it's cookies. So I was dressed as a cookie. I didn't have any lines, but I felt the rush of the audience, you know, the, the applause from the audience. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is exactly what I want to do. Oh my God people get paid for this. Oh my God. And I wanted to do that. Um, I did eventually play. I think I was in, a, a, yeah, I was in a play called the little match girl as well uh, at the children's theater. Did you play the girl or the match? No, I, I didn't. I, I was, I was just a, a townsfolk, but they had all these layers and levels and stuff like that. And, um, where you could just jump off because it, one scene you had, there was a blackout and, and all, the entire town had to disappear. So everybody had to basically jump off these ramps into these big crash cushions. And I remember that was the greatest thrill of all, just being on stage and then disappearing and then getting to fall on a big mat backstage. That was, that was fun. But the, then hearing the audience applaud was, that I was just, that was like crack. What, yeah, what, what is that about? I mean, a lot of, a lot of actors, is it validation? Is it attention? Is it like, what were you getting from the audience? I think because it went in my living room, I didn't have applause. You know, I was all alone the swing, in the breeze. swing, you know, the, the wheatgrass <laughs> out the front swaying back and forth. But I, I think I, I had finally, yeah, I guess maybe validation, you know, but I liked, I liked making people laugh. And it was, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I was the class clown and I turned it into a career, I always say, because I just made people laugh because I was, like I said, a fat toady little boy and the bullies would come after me. And the best way to make them get on your side is to make them laugh. And I would do that. And it just kind of turned in, I, I knew how to make people laugh. Um, so that's, that's, I guess, how it happened. And so, yeah. So then you were doing, you were getting shipped off to Minneapolis. Yeah. And then was high school different or did you? Were, you know what? And then I skipped and then I skipped because you go through puberty and you go through all the ugly phases and you're just, you know, you're just odd. You don't know who you are and you're trying to fit in. But I learned too that you, you know, the less you fit in, the better you are. And um, if you don't play the game the way everybody wants you to play it, the more you stand out. So I, I started doing that, and that's indeed what happened. And then I got involved um, more in speech, speech and theater in in high school more than anything, um, and the local community theater, which is the Maskers Theater Company in Force Lake, Minnesota, which is three miles away from Wyoming, Minnesota. And uh, I did shows with them. And then in high school, I did uh, shows. And, and there is where it really clicked hard. So much so that um, I had some teachers in, in Force Lake Senior High that uh, saw something in me. And they took me aside, my friends. And I call them friends now because they were amazing. Uh, Jane Gillis, Henry Hebert, and Deb Bendix. They took me aside one day. They brought me into the teacher's lounge. And they said, we need to talk to you. And it was like an intervention. <laughs> and they said, you need to get out of here. And this was like 11th grade. You need to get out of here. What do you mean? 
and I, I'm like tearing up and everything. And I was like, that you were in trouble. I thought I was in trouble because yeah. they, you know, I, I always, I was hung around not older people, but more mature people. Cause I, like I said, I didn't play the games of like high school and all. I didn't, you know, I learned that being in a clique doesn't make you popular. Mm -hmm. Being in the clique makes you popular. Um, you know, being part of that makes you popular, but when you actually break it apart, there's nothing there. I mean, I wanted connections with people. So I actually knew people's middle names. I knew their eye color, but you ask anybody in the clique, you know, the popular clique, and I'm using air quotes, how boring, but if you, you know, if you ask anybody in that clique of the perceived popular people, they couldn't tell you anything about these people. They were just a group on mass and they were protected because they were part of this weird group. Mm -hmm. And I, I went opposite of that. But anyway, so my teachers, uh, they took me aside and they said, you need to get out of here. You need to find a school in New York. Like, and they make this happen because this is something you should really do. And I said, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. I, I you know, my parents didn't have any money. So I, uh, they said, well, we'll help you. And they, they did, they brought, they drove me to Minneapolis and we went to the Minneapolis L public library and we, uh, looked for schools and, uh, we found a few and, um, and then I was accepted to the American Musical Dramatic Academy in New York City. And um, and then from that point on, I worked my butt off to save every dime I possibly could to get myself to New York. And I came I came to New York with about, I think, $6,000, which is a lot of money in a year for working basically two or three minimum wage jobs. Mm -hmm. But I worked every single day after high school, after, after school, before school. Um, Every weekend, I never had a break. I was just go, go, go because I knew I had to do this. So I paid for my own airfare and I paid for my own apartment. Um, and I came to New York and I soon realized that toilet paper just doesn't appear. <laughs> <laughs> and soap just doesn't appear. Um, and no one does your, there's no one to do your laundry. You have to do it. So it was, it was quite the <laughs> shock for me. Um, but also um, $6,000 uh, in 1988, you know, it was considerable amount of money. And then, uh, you live in New York city and, and it goes fast. Boy, did it go fast. So yeah. I was out of money probably within less than six months. No you know? kidding. Yeah. So did you have survival jobs? Well, cause I, do? Oh yeah. I worked at the last, uh, there was a toy store called the last wound up on 73rd and Columbus Avenue. And it was in 1988, 1989, 1990. I worked there, uh, part-time and, um, it was a little wind up store. So all these little toys, they had hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of wind-up toys, little plastic things, you know, made in mm -hmm. Japan and China. And um, it was cool. And, so, and they had music boxes and everything. And um, so that's what I did probably hmm, probably seven hours out of the day. I worked at a wind-up store. Plus, I went to school at the same time. Then I worked at Men's Express, you know, the fashion store on oh, Columbus yes. Avenue. And then I worked uh, – I was a personal assistant for this guy named Barry Hendrickson who um, – had done hair and wigs for the mystery of Edwin Drood, the original production. And I got to know it. And that was one of my first, um, I guess, mature. He wasn't mature. I mean, he, right now he, when I met him, he was younger than I, I am now, but he was probably in his mid to late thirties. And he, he was the first kind of comfortable, openly gay man that I met in New York city. And he was just, Fine. And I was grew up, I grew up in Minnesota in a small town where of course you can't do that. You can't be that. Of course I was, but, um, he, Barry, uh, was this wonderful, wonderful guy who taught me just chill, be, be cool. It's okay. So you're gay, whatever. And, um, he, he brought me out, uh, he brought me out. He was. He brought me to, he, he brought me, this is so gross, but he, he brought me to, um, he said, we're going out. I was like, okay, great. We're going out. And I think I'm 19 at maybe at this time, maybe. And he said, we, we're going to the Eagle, which is, you know, for those of you who don't know the Eagle, the Eagle is a pretty much an S and M leather bar for bears, you know, hairy, big guys. And there is a back room there. So he says, I'm not going to let you out of my sight, but we're going in here just so you can see. I'm giving you slices of life. Okay. We're not going to stay long. So let's just go. And I just want to show you stuff. So we went down there and he says, so he said, so just, so just come with me. And I, I got in there and it, like, listen, I am adorable. Now you should have seen me when I was 19. I was adorable. 
So cute. So I walk into this bar, this darkened bar with all these, you know, guys in leather and chains and, and they're kind of like, yeah, look at this guy. Look at this young little thing popping in there. Oh yeah. And I'm Barry, 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 don't let me go. Don't let me go. So he says, now come with me. I just want to show you. We're not doing anything. I just want to show you when he brings me back to the back room. And I said, just peek in. And I was like, oh, oh my. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. They do that? How do they do that? Oh, that's happening. Ooh, wow. Oh my God. Oh, okay. You've seen enough. Now we're going to the monster, which is still there. It's in Greenwich Village. And um, uh, upstairs is a piano bar. And uh, he says, so what can I get you to drink? And I said, I don't know. Um, I heard something called a zombie. (laughs) <laughs> which is like 13 different kinds of rum or something like that. <laughs> and I'm 19 at this point. He says, don't worry about it. It's New York. Nobody cares. <laughs> so he got me a zombie and I'm like sipping. And it's like, it's drinking sweet lighter fluid, basically, yeah. is what yeah. it is. <laughs> With some orange juice in it. <laughs> and um, so then we we uh, we stayed there for a little bit and uh, some lo- lovely people got up to sing. And there at the Monster, it's, of course, it's the community. So it's like a slice of everybody's there. So it was great. And that's when I realized, wow, you know, I shouldn't be a, have to hide anymore. And that was great. So that I credit a lot to Barry Hendrickson. He was he was one of the craziest characters. He's still alive. He's got a little place called Bits and Pieces over, over on Broadway right now. And um, he sells makeup and hair stuff. And he does he did Cher's wig at one point. He, really? Yeah. Yeah. So he has a picture of Cher. And, oh, actual Cher, not the Cher actual show. Cher. No, the okay, Cher, yeah. he, actual, actual Cher. Yeah. Anyway, so wow, where did we go? Where we took a left turn. We were talking about your grandma. Oh, yeah. thanks, Jane. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my grandmother was very cute. When I moved to New York, that was one of the funny things. She would. Uh, I was only here not even a year, and she made all these postcards for me already pre-stamped, so I could write her every day. Oh, I know, isn't that sweet? Oh. So I wrote her. I wrote her a postcard every. She gave me like three hundred, so I wow. had my work cut out for me. But I, I would write her like Grandma, because it's a postcard. There's yeah. not a lot. You can't just write a tome. Grandma, I saw the back room of the. Yeah, eagle. I saw the back room you of the eagle, this. and I went. The monster had a zombie and sang at a piano bar. It was awesome. <laughs> um, but uh, so, but she sent me all these postcards, and she, she sent them with me, and. I would write her every now and then. And then we would we would speak on the phone because they said, call, collect, call, collect, call, collect. So I'd call, collect. And she said, oh, why don't you sign up for one of them soaps? What? Why don't you sign up for one of them soaps? The soap? Soap? Soap operas? Yeah. So it's just sign up. Like, I haven't thought of that, Grandma. Why? Did, of course, I'm going to just sign up just and get on one of those soap operas. Show yeah. up and say, I'm here yeah, now. I'm here. I'm signing up. Um, she said, why don't you sign up for that Regis and Kathy Lee show? Because then I can see you. <laughs> so sweet. I mean, come on. That's so sweet. Um, anyway, so that's grandma. I love, I love grandma Jane. People, people have no idea what the industry, how the industry operates. Oh, I, you know, I, you know, the thing why is. Why don't you just go on TV? Why don't you just go on? Why don't you just sign up for one of them shows? Just be on one of those shows. It'll be easy. <laughs> Believe me, it is not as one has done a few. It is not. It is not. Well, did you? You were eighty-eight. You said. Did you have at any point like, like regret of like, what am I doing here? I'm. You went from this tiny, tiny yeah. town oh, well, to the city of millions. Oh, oh, yeah. It was a shock. I mean, I remember getting on that plane October third, nineteen eighty-eight, and um, with my the plane ticket that I purchased myself, and I sat down in the seat and. Uh, it was in the very back of the plane and I didn't even have a window. That's how far back it was. And it was filled with, I, I like to call these guys, Bill Braskies. It's like the business guys with the pagers on their belt and mm-hmm. stuff like that. And they have their briefcase and they've traveled all the time. And so they're just grumpy. Um, I was sitting next to uh, a Bill Brasky and, um, uh, I was in on the window. I always liked the window and, and I just burst into tears because I was just, it, it was scary as hell. It was scary hell. And, you know, no one there to hold my hand. It was all by myself. I did this all by myself. Um, To take a leap like that is immense. That's insane. You know, you're moving to a city you don't know. I've only been to once and that was only for like three days. And that was like just to check out the school and maybe see the Statue of Liberty. And that was it. So I didn't know the city at all. Um, And I got on a plane and I landed at LaGuardia and I took a cab to... Uh, 73rd and Broadway. And I met, met the people at the school. And then I was in my new apartment, which was a shithole. Um, it used to be an SRO. Um, 
and they decided, no, you're going to be rooming with somebody. So it was like maybe a 200, maybe less, 150 square foot studio apartment that I shared with my roommate, Dirk Etchison. And we made the best of it. We had a closet that was about as deep as your palm. So <laughs> you could open it up and you could hang a jacket. Um, I was like, why do they even put a door on here? I don't even know why they put a door on here. Uh, we had a small, small refrigerator and a hot plate. I didn't have enough stove, no stove. Yeah. And, and barely refrigerated. It was like total college dorm. Luckily, we did have our own bathroom because there were apartments in that. And I use apartments quite loosely. They were, it was, but it was mine. And it was $275 a month. Can you imagine? Oh my God. Can you imagine playing $275 a month? It was a slum, basically. Yeah, you for know? New York, yeah. And I asked, I asked the the uh, housing coordinator, so so what kind of view do I have? And he says, well, you've got a view of a tree. And then when I finally got there, I was like, I want to see my tree that I saw. No, it was just a dead, dead poison sumac tree outside the window. <laughs> That's all it was. <laughs> it was great. And um, But uh, I remember trying to find a job when I finally did get there, and I was so terrified that um, anyone who knows New York City, so I was on 73rd and Broadway, I went – down across 73rd East to Columbus Avenue. And I went South on seven on, on uh, Columbus Avenue to 72nd street and came back West on 72nd street and rent back to my apartment. And I didn't find a job. So it was useless. It was pointless, <laughs> pointless, not going to find a job. I went a block. Yeah. I went one New York city block and I didn't find a job. So I thought it's over. I'm never going to have a job. It's over. And you went back and cried. And I went back and cried. So that was that was eighty eight. Amda's yeah. two year two year certificate. Yes, what's this? Two year certificate is Amda. Yeah, or, yeah. So yeah. then, so then ninety, you graduate. Yeah, you're out in the world. Yeah, and you made your Broadway debut in ninety four. Uh huh. So four years is not bad what for was a that Broadway. Christmas Carol. That was a uh, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast. Gaston. Was that ninety four? No, it wasn't. That's what no, I it was ninety nine. What? It was ninety nine. I think. Yeah. Did I, did I typo? Yeah, it was. It was ninety nine. All right, but so 94, that would no, that was around when Brooks Ash Manskis and I did Paper Moon. So you are technically correct. There you go. 94. Technically correct. Brooks Ash Manskis and I met and we were adorable. We were adorable. And uh, we, it was this new show based on the novel and movie of Paper Moon, um, written by Larry Grossman and the lyrics by Ellen Fitzhugh and Carol Hall. And um, we had, who was it? Christine Ebersall, Greg Harrison, Linda Hart was in it. And um, we thought, we, both of us, it was our Broadway debut. So we did it out at Paper Mill Playhouse. And I had never worked there before. Um, this was kind of a humongous deal for me. Um, I remember I had a line and I had to audition for the show. Um, well, of course I had to audition for the show, but my, my roommate, uh, my former roommate, Katie Finneran, it's so crazy how you know people from your life. Andre Burns was my roommate at one point too. Crazy, <laughs> crazy. Anyway, so um, I called her when I got this audition. They said, hey, here are, uh, is a line that you have to say in the audition. And so come in with your song and come in with your dancing and blah, blah, blah. And we're going to, but you're going to have to read this line, you know, because we want to see if you, how you do it. I'm fine. And the line was, well, there you are. I wondered where you gone to. Hey, where's your paw? And so I called Katie Finneran on the phone. And I said, Katie, can you help me with an audition? I have a line that I, they want me to say, and I want to make sure that I'm saying it right. And she was like, um, yeah, okay. Because she was in my favorite year at the time at Lincoln Center. And so I, I said the line. <laughs> she says, Chris, that is so good. You're you're so good. It's You're going to get it. You're going to get it. <laughs> like, do you think so? Do you really think so? And um, she was right. I got the part. I got this part. And it was the photographer in the show. I mean, I was other parts as well. But I, I played the photographer that I put Addie Prey on the moon. And there's a sad picture of her alone on the moon. And and that's my line. Hey, there you are. I wonder where you've gone to. Where's your pa? And I'm thinking, so I got this part now. I might be eligible for a Tony Award. <laughs> <laughs> I might have myself a Tony nomination for my very first and for my one line. One line. They should make a category for best one line. One line. Or or be best, best, best cross. Role, best role with. Best cross. Yeah, best cross with under 10 lines yes, in a Broadway exactly. production. Yeah. Yeah, best breakout role. Uh, 
<laughs> well, what happened? So, so with, let, I'll just I'll just wrap up on Paper Moon because it was quite the experience and it was quite the awakening for a young actor who wants to be on Broadway so badly. And the first time it ever happens to you, it doesn't happen. Um, the box office was open at the Marriott Marquis Theater, and our poster or our our marquee was up, and um, our names were on the poster board. You know the the, the whatever they call that. What do they call that? The box, the thing with the names. With the what name. Is, what is that called? The, 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 the name the box thing. with the name box, box names. The thing, not, you know, yeah, so our names are on it. So come the on. Broadway cast box it, names. It, yeah. yeah, it's the thrill of seeing your name on a Broadway theater in a Broadway show that you're part of for the very first time. That is insanely cool. That's great. So uh, Roger Berlind, our producer, um, things weren't going well out of town. Um, people were fighting and it was just, you know, but Brooks and I, we didn't really know this because this is our first, first experience. So we're just like, hey, I guess this is what it's like. Fine. Yay. But we were so excited. So Roger Berlin comes in one day about two weeks prior to us closing uh, at Paper Mill Playhouse. And he, and he has, he says, I just wanted to talk to everybody. I have everyone's Broadway contracts right here. And he said, I want you all to sign them right now. And we all signed that Broadway contract right there, then and there. And he says, made sure that everyone got, signed them and got them back to him. And then after he says, as long as now that I have them all back, I just want to let you know we're not going to Broadway. Now, the thing about that is per equity and the production rules is you, you, if a show closes after you, after you sign your Broadway contract, but you never go to Broadway, you get two weeks pay of Broadway. Mm -hmm. Now, some producers would never, ever do that. But Roger Berlin was not that producer. Roger Berlin was classy. He's always well, still, I think he's still alive, but he was wonderful. He was wonderful. And he made sure, because he knew there were a lot of people going to be crushed and disappointed. So he made sure that we signed a Broadway contract and we got two weeks Broadway pay. I mean, that is cool. That's classy. That, yeah, that's, that's respectable. really classy. So that's why I count Paper Moon as a Broadway show. Huh. Yeah. That's very cool. Um, he didn't have to do that. No, he didn't have to no. at all. That's... You could have said, we're not going in, bye. Yeah, that speaks speaks a lot to someone's character doing things like that. But the other roles you've had, mm -hmm. um, so you, you, you've been guest on yeah. in Beauty and the Beast yeah. and uh, Lord Farquaad and Shrek's <laughs> or Galahad and Spamalot yes. and now like, even Trent Oliver and The Problem. All of them are kind of um, full of themselves. Yeah, yeah. It is Apparently, that's my gift. That, there's two things. I, I if, if it's funny and I can hurt myself, get Sieber. <laughs> I, I've hurt myself so many times. Um, and yes, I play arrogant very well, apparently. I guess, I guess, because I'm completely not that way. Yeah, you don't all. see, you don't I, seem arrogant. I am not, not arrogant. no, no, anything. I'm just like, uh, uh. but um, yeah, I found a niche and um, also a quick replacement. If you need someone in a second, I'm, the, I'm your guy. I'll go in a show in four days, which I've done before. For which, which show? Uh, well, two, well, three. Maybe four. I don't know. Let's see. Um, well, Spamalot was one um, because what happened was I I was supposed to audition for the show originally, but I had just come back from doing company in Los Angeles at Reprise and playing Bobby. And that show and that role will make you kind of go down a rabbit hole. So I was so emotionally and physically exhausted. Hmm. And I took the red eye home to audition at like 11 a.m. from Los Angeles. And I slept through the whole thing. And I didn't wake up till four. And my phone was ringing like crazy. And people thought I was dead. Um, my husband finally came in and, and he woke me up. He says, you missed your audition. I was like, what, 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 what happened? So I missed the audition. So I didn't get the job. Doug Sills got the job. Anyway, months, months had passed. And um, uh, Doug decided that he doesn't, he doesn't understand the comedy of this. And he wanted to leave. He wants to go. I know. He, he, he was like, I'm, it's time to go. I was, so Bob Boyette, um, who was the producer of the show, was a friend of mine who produced my first TV show. He, he said, I have something for you and you can't say anything. All I have to say is I need you tomorrow and call, have your agent call Tara Rubin, the casting director. I was like, that's very cryptic, Bob. That's very cryptic. What is it? He said, I need you to come in to replace Doug Sills in Spamalot. I was like, oh shit, that's insane. Okay, great. Okay, so... Uh, the next morning I get a call from Tara Rubin and it's 7 a.m. And uh, I'm doing city opera at the time. So I'm, I'm up until 1130, you know, late 
and I get a call. So I'm sleeping in normally. And she says, Hey, can you be in front of Mike Nichols and Eric Idle <laughs> the next day? <laughs> uh, at, at by, uh, I think it was uh, 9 30 or 10 a.m. or something. Can you do that? And I said, uh, I, Call me back because I really don't know what I'm what you're saying anymore because I just woke up. I, hold on, just give me a second. So she sends me the script and she sends me the sides. She said, Can you read the script? And I was like, I have an hour to read an entire script and memorize the sides. She says, yeah. Do you have a comedy song? I said, no, but I'll find one. I'll make, I'll make something up. It's fine. So I go in there. And luckily, the scene that I was doing, because I love Monty Python, and I, I grew up watching that, because that was the one channel that you could get in Minnesota, mm-hmm. was PBS, and they would play Monty Python after 10 p.m., which is way past my bedtime. So I would sneak downstairs and watch it, watch Monty Python. It made, made me laugh. But then the, the Holy Grail movie came out, and I watched that incessantly, like to the point where it was like crack. It was like, I had to have it. I had to have it. I had to watch it. So the scene they gave me was Dennis Mudd scene, which is what we call Dennis Mudd scene. Um, and I knew it like the back of my hand because I've known it my entire life. And so I looked at the side and was like, oh, I know this. I even know the dialect. I know everything about it. So I went in there and I, um, that was, and Mike Nichols even said, my boy, how, how do you know this scene? It's so complicated. And I was like, I've known this since I was nine. Okay. And he says, okay, all right. <laughs> then I sang, and then I sang, and then I sang uh, Agony um, from Into the Woods, but mm-hmm. I sang it like uh, uh, someone with a split personality, and apparently it worked because they laughed. So, and then uh, then that day, that 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 day, I started rehearsals, and they were we were going to Chicago to 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 start the show in, in, at the Schubert Theater in Chicago. Uh, I, the first thing they did was they threw me into the other room to get my measurements and put a costume on me and started doing the costumes. And, um, then at the first time I ever met Sada Ramirez and they shoved me in a room with her and we did the song that goes like this. And then I, uh, that night I burst into tears, crying, freaking out. Cause I was like, <laughs> ah, what's happening? What's happening? So, but that was, and then, um, uh, yeah, so fast. That was a quick replacement. Uh, a quick replacement was in Thoroughly Modern Millie after I took over from Mark Kudish after I did Into the Woods. No, was it? Yeah, Into the Woods. Um, and I, they gave me four days. And so I did that, which is crazy to learn a patter song like that in four days. You know, you'll never forget a patter song. Mm-mm. In clothes, you'll find a small container of the stuff I talk about. Just carefully remove the lid and take it with you. But that you never forget those. Um, and then I went into, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Le Cage à Folle, uh, with Harvey Firestein at the mm-hmm. Long Acre Theater where The Prom is playing right yep. now. And um, uh, Jeffrey Tambor, uh, who was playing George at the time, uh, had hip surgery or something and he just couldn't even, he could barely move anymore. Um, and so I was going to go back into the show, Chicago, <laughs> this long, long sorted road that I'm telling you. But I was, so I was going back into the show, Chicago, uh, to play Billy Flynn, which I think was my third time playing at the ambassador mm-hmm. theater. Um, I get a phone call while I'm at the box office and them saying, saying, no, we don't want you to see Chicago today. Uh, you know, to refamiliarize yourself with the show that you're about to go into that you haven't done in five years. So yeah, let's go see another show instead. Let's go see Le Cage à Faux, which is great. Fine. Whatever you want. Uh, I went over there. Harvey is a, a good friend of mine. So I'm, I'm watching him and Jeffrey's tambour is nowhere to be found. <laughs> so, uh, I was like, well, that's odd. My friend Chris Hoke, who had understudied me many times, is on stage opposite him as George. And after the show, David Bobani, the, the producer, finds me in my seat and he grabs me and he says, Harvey wants to see you. And I was like, of course, of course, absolutely. So I go up be backstage after the show and I knock on Harvey's dressing room, <laughs> dressing room door and all you hear is, enter! <laughs> and um, he's strapped in like a, a towel, like robe with like a turban on and, and a and he's, his eyes get really big and he opens the door and he says, get in here. He grabs me. He slams the door. He throws me on his couch. He says, are you going to do the show with me? Are you going to do the show with me? It's like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what's going on. He said, Jeffrey Tambor just up and left. He just up and left me. I did one night, one night stands that lasted longer. <laughs> and so <laughs> Jeffrey just left. So I said, I, I don't, okay, what? What's happening? He says, yeah. So I want you to do it opposite me. And I was like, Oh, yes, yes. When do I start? Now. Like, okay, okay, okay. So seven days later, I'm playing opposite Harvey. <laughs> they gave me more time, but I was like, come on, let's just do it. Let's just throw it in there. Let's just go. You know, anybody who knows the show and knows Harvey, and, and at this point, anybody seeing the show knows the drama because it was, it was a good, you know, Michael Reel did a thing about it, and it was like crazy, you know, look at him go. And it was, of course, just, 
terrifying, but of course I was there with my friend Harvey. So, yeah. and he guided me and to watch him do that was, was insane. It was a very good impression. Oh, well, I've, I've known him a long time. Yeah. I've known him a long <laughs> do time. you ever impersonate him for him? No, no. <laughs> but I can tell when he has a cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to fast forward to the to the prom here yes. because you've been uh, you were involved. Gosh, since when, day one, day one, yeah. seven. It's how almost, many years? Almost ago? seven years. Seven ago. years ago. Right? We're not quite sure the date, but it's we just keep saying seven. Yeah, because it is pretty much seven years. Yeah, but you've like the character was created for you. Yeah, like how, tell me that whole story. Like, well, what, it. So what happened? You know, uh, Casey Nicola and I worked together a couple times as. Uh, I, fairly modern Millie. He was in the ensemble. Um, and, uh, I was Trevor Graydon. Yeah. Trevor Graydon. And, and, but we, you know, Broadway's weird because you know, everybody, even though if you never work with each other, you, you just know each other. It's mm-hmm. just high school where everybody's cool and everybody's fun. And, um, so I was walking on the street one day and we did spam a lot, of course. And after he, he just approached me and he says, Hey, 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 I was, I was about to call you. I was like, what? I said, I've got something for you. I was like, what, what, what is it? We don't know. I was like, okay, great. Sounds fun. <laughs> and he says, uh, I'll call you in like two weeks and uh, we'll meet up at my place and we'll just read it. Cause we, we don't know what it is, but we think there's something there. So I was like, great. So I get there and Brooks, Beth, Angie, and myself are there. And Matthew Sklar is playing the piano and singing. I think he had two or three songs already done. He didn't have all of them. Bob Martin was there of course, and Chad Begman were there and Casey Nicklaw was there. And we read this thing, it was no title. Um, and I don't know if the characters had names yet. Um, we had, I think Trent was always Trent, but I don't think Dee Dee Allen was always Dee Dee Allen, like Beth, Beth's part. Mm-hmm. Um, and we read this thing and they didn't tell us it. They wrote it with us in mind that we just kind of read it. And, and it, it obviously clearly just clicked with all of us because they know us well. And it just turned into this, and we we all kind of after we read, and it wasn't even finished. I mean, we we didn't we didn't really have an act the end of Act Two until, gosh, right before we left for Atlanta, uh, which was five years later, four or four or five years later. And we just clicked, and we all kind of sat back in our chairs, like, "Wow, this is something. This is something cool." And we all four of us have never not been involved. We've no one else has played these parts ever. Wow ever. And that's a rare thing. And it, first of all, it's rare that somebody says, Hey, I wrote something for you. Come play with us. Plus then, you know, I knew Bob, I knew Chad, I knew Matthew, I knew Casey. I, we knew everybody. So it was like getting into a room with people and just kind of playing. And it was the safest, most comfortable I, I for comedy to be in, because if we were going to make a mistake, make it. And it was awesome. And then we can point and laugh at each other. That's what we did the entire process. The room that we were in creating this, the rooms that we were in there creating it, it was always fun. There was always laughter. There was, it was hard, hard, hard work, but it was so much fun, hard work. Beth, I always say Beth, because Beth is so brilliant. And she said it in an interview one time and I always steal it, but she said it was the easiest hard work that, that we've ever done. But you all seem like genuine friends. We are friends. Like, yeah. Like we are, we've we, known each other. We've for known each other for a long time decades. and it comes across on stage. Someone yeah. asked asked me uh, the other day. It was like, "Do you guys just like on stage? You guys just like improving and fooling around?" I was like, "No, because it was created that way. It was created where we we're just kind of throwing around things and you know using Bob and Chad's script, and and then we would kind of add things. But if it if it worked, it was in the script, and if it didn't, it was out. It was fine. <laughs> and there, it there it was we tried everything, and so." People said, All right, so you guys are just, because it seems like it's just kind of happening, and which is great, which is what you want. It's spontaneous. Spontaneous. Yeah. Like yeah. it's happening, like you're actually having a conversation <laughs> and that you know each other and that, you know, there are, you know, lots of different energies that, you know, you like this person more than like this, you like this person. And that comes across. And they they said, so you're improv I was like, no. All of that is scripted. If you look at the script at the same time that we're saying and doing the show, it's all there. It seems like it's kind of just like whatever, you know, comes off the cup, but that it's not. Yeah, the, the four of you together work work absolutely brilliantly. And and yeah, it fits like it's obviously made for all of yeah. you in mind. Yeah. So and that um, never but, happens. That for, never happens. Yeah, for the for the four originals to, to stick with it the yeah. entire time. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Whose idea was it to make your character all obsessed with Juilliard? <laughs> well, there was that was cover. Um, there was a, a thing between, uh, it was Chad 
Bob and myself because it was, Trent was kind of the character that they didn't because they really wanted to develop a story with with Barry uh, Brooks and uh, Caitlin Emma. They really wanted to develop that story and then to, devo- to develop the story with Beth and Mr. Um, Mr. Hawkins, the principal. Um, and Angie and I are definitely supporting characters, by, but um, so you, the one thing is you knew who Angie was, you knew who uh, Brooks was and you knew who uh, Beth was, but you, re- you really didn't know who Trent was. You didn't really know who he was. And so I was always trying to find ways. How can you make him? Who is he? Why is he? You know, you, you know, just to make a character real and breathe. Right. So um, I kept on coming up with this ideas that he was obsessed with. I based him on a couple people. One in which that he had a Tony nomination long, 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 long time ago, but he's still living and dressing as if he is in that era. And he won't let you forget about it, that he was once nominated for a Tony Award way, way back, way, Mm -hmm. way, way back a long time ago. And so one of the ideas, rather than Juilliard, was uh, that he would be wearing a show jacket from that era of some obscure show. Or then I thought maybe if it was like Starlight Express, you know, that he (laughs) still, but he's wearing like, it's a satin jacket, you know, so dated, but it was his glory day and he can't let go of the glory day. Um, And so they decided how about uh, that he's obsessed with Juilliard and he was just never shuts up about it. And that was one of the ideas or, or he, or he talks about Starlight Express He's always talking. About this. So we, we decided because who knew if who knew if there was going to be any sort of lawsuit? It was like you can't talk about Starlight Express like that. But Juilliard, we had a lot of Juilliard students come, and they were like, "Oh, you nailed him! <laughs> <laughs> you nailed him! I know him! I completely know who he is." <laughs> and um, so, but yeah, it, it, he was he was a, and it's he's, he's a hard character to play because if you read if you read it, um, it's he, Trent's not funny. I mean, that's the part of the humor and why he is funny is because he's not funny. He tries to be, but he's just a bore. He's a weird, weird man. And he's not funny. And that's what's funny about him. He's mm-hmm. just boring as hell. And it's just like, he just goes on and on and on. And that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. But so uh, the the show itself, I mean, there's the four... The four of you are the four, I put in air quotes, washed up celebrities, yeah. exaggerated versions of yeah. your real life yes. selves. Um, but it's also like the, stu- the story of 17-year-old lesbian played by Caitlin, uh, who's barred from taking her girlfriend to the prom. So there's like a real, there's a real message, there's a real re- yeah. retribution going on yeah. underneath. Uh, like what kind of audience feedback do you get? Has this, and has this like sort of changed you as a, as a person? Well, the one thing... Uh, one thing that I guess I, I don't know if it surprised, I think it surprised me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. When we were in Atlanta, we were at the Alliance Theater and we tried it out there and we, we put it up and that's where we finally staged it with a set and costumes and orchestrations and everything. And that's when your show really comes together and you kind of need all, of course, you need all those elements to make something happen. We would have talkbacks after the show and we were still in development. So the show was not set by any means. We're still futzing with stuff and, you know, seeing if we change this or we change that. Maybe, you know, and we would have talkbacks afterwards and there would be young, you know, it's Atlanta, Georgia. So it's kind of a purple city. So we would have people um, saying, you know, young, young lesbians or young gay kids um, would say stuff and, and get choked up because they finally saw themselves represented. And then we had people say that um, if I had really truly know what the show was about, um, if I knew it was about, I probably wouldn't have come, but I'm so glad I did because it changed my mind. Mm-hmm. And um, we had one woman uh, say, uh, Mrs. Green is kind of like the antagonist in our show. And she is um, Emma's, not Emma's, uh, Alyssa's mom. And Alyssa's the other lesbian in the show. And we didn't want to make her an enemy, the mom. She's the antagonist, but we didn't want to make her an enemy. So we made her just, well, eventually uh, a mom who just cares so much about her daughter and doesn't want her daughter to have a hard life. And so that was really hard. That was one of the hardest things we had to, well, Bob and Chad did, you know. Um, but there was a woman uh, at a talk back and she says, I am Mrs. Green. I am Mrs. Green. 
And she started getting choked up. And then we went out to the lobby and she said, I would like to introduce you to my grandchild. And this is um, my daughter. And this is my daughter's wife. I mean, right? Are you crying? Come on. Yeah. I mean, that's how beautiful is that? I mean, that we hear that, that as far as feedback, we hear, a, you know, Ryan Murphy bought out our show one night. He, he had kids from the Hedrick Martin Institute there, about 300 of them who had probably, A, never seen a Broadway show, and B, never saw themselves represented in such a way. And uh, it was, the response from them was insane. It was like a sitcom audience. They, it, they, it was the best audience we've ever had. It, it was just immense. And the tears they had. And I have a song in Act 2 called Love Thy Neighbor where it's about the Bible. And it's about, um, you know, you can't just say, get, it says to be gay in the Bible is, is wrong. So, you, you know, it says so in the Bible. And we follow the Bible. And I said, well, there's a lot of other things in the Bible that you're probably, there's a lot of rules that you're probably breaking too. And they're like, well, that's different, one of the kids says. And then the entire audience of these kids are like, how? How is it different? <laughs> how? Like anger, because that's stuff, you know, that you had to deal with their entire lives, including mine. And like, how? And nobody ever responds like that, but they were there because they were trying to defend themselves. But then, you know, it's a great number. And of course, everything ends up in the happy place at the end. But, but uh, and at the, oh, it was insane. The tears. And every night after, after a show, every single Every single show at, at the uh, outside the stage door, so, someone signing autographs. There's a kid or two or three or ten, shaking and crying, shaking and crying, and it, I, I give them a hug and you know, and I say thanks for coming, you know, and I, I see you, you know, and you matter. So, wow, God, I wish I had a show like this when I was growing up. Right? Yeah, that's what I've heard. Uh heard from a couple others in the show too that I've talked to that just they they just they see themselves represented for the first time yeah. and uh yeah it's it's just like I I can't talk enough say enough good things about right the prom it, it, without it, making you know we don't make fun of anybody no if you're anything it's no. all us we make fun of ourselves make fun of Broadway we make fun of Broadway and ourselves um I remember somebody was writing, it was like the finger point, like love thy neighbor, my number. It was like a finger pointery number. And I was like, well, it's really not because it's all true. <laughs> We're not pointing fingers at all. Yeah. We're just kind of saying the truth, you know? Yeah. And, you know, we say Trump 12 times in the show and the song. So if you're, you know, if you're a supporter, you know, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, in the interest of time, oh gonna, gosh, I yeah, know we're gonna wrap. Oh, this. TikTok, I gotta go. I gotta go to the gym. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I know. Boy. I know. I gotta keep myself in shape for Broadway. So we have three questions okay. here that uh, I is always. This have, the wrap up. Yeah, this is the wrap up. Okay. I always ask everybody to okay. close us out. The first question, simply, what motivates you? What motivates me? Yeah. Fear. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Fear I, of fear of like not being able to do this. I got to go. I got to keep going. I it's stagnant. I can't be, I can't just sit around. I have fear of being, doing nothing. I have to do stuff. I have to do, create something. Fear of not creating. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I accept. Okay. What advice would you give to <laughs> your you? Young, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now, starting out down a similar path? Don't sweat the small stuff. You know, as you get older, everything is, you don't know everything, first and foremost. Yes, I still don't know everything. I'm a lot calmer now that I've gotten older. Don't sweat stuff. You know, you, the stuff you think is really important right now, you'll realize mm, probably in five or seven years, maybe even less, it's really not that important. As long as you're healthy and you're happy and you're kind, you should be good. Cool. And then last question, if you can only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what show would you see? Not including ours? Any show. Including, you know what the thing is about doing a Broadway show that you're, it's a hit, you know, and you're in it, you never get to see it. Have you ever seen your, your own show? I have never seen my own show. No, I never saw Shrek. I, you know, cause I was in it. Yeah. Spam a lot. Never saw it. Well, I saw it afterwards, but it's right. not with us, you know. You know, it's like I saw the other production. It's not the same. So I would love to see. <laughs> I would kind of like to see me and the everybody in the cast in the show of the prom. I would love to see that. 
Can would, you can you call out one day and just I can't sneak in? see that's the thing. You have to be in it because we're the four people that are kind of like the clockwork. So if I was out, it would be really weird for me. I would have to watch me do it. You know, you know what I mean? Like yeah, step outside, yeah. like being a like a you know, out what is that? Experience. Bizarro world, a bizarro world where I, you know, could see because <laughs> I'd have to see the the whole thing with everybody, the original cast. That's all. And I, that's the thing yeah. when you're in a hit Broadway show, you never get to see it. That's right. Well, we can find you online on Twitter at the real Yep. And it's Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> Man, great, great with the typos. Instagram at Christopher underscore Sieber. Mm-hmm. Uh, anywhere else? Not yet. Not yet. All right. They'll find me. Yeah. You can get more of me and the theater podcast, theaterpodcast.com slash Patreon to support us uh, at theater underscore podcast on Instagram and Twitter, facebook.com slash official theater podcast. Please rate, review, leave a review. We love to five stars, five Five stars, five five stars. stars. This is produced by Jillian Hockman, music by Jukebox the Ghost, Chris Sieber. Thank you. I have enjoyed this so much. Me too. Had a nice time. Thank you. Make the world a little colorful